All right, I see we've got one person on. Who's, who's out there this morning on a Monday? Good morning, Jerry. Davis is on. Good morning, Davis. Hope you had a good weekend. Teresa, like a rock, always there. Morning, Cheryl. We're doing a men's thing tonight, Cheryl, and we're, we're, the, the food I know won't be nearly as good as it would be if we had you did it, but we're just throwing some burgers on the grill. So, yeah, good morning, Wilson. Good morning, Emily. Tell your dad, I, John, I said hi. I haven't seen him in a while. Great guy. So, I hope everyone had a good weekend. We'll give people a minute or two to jump on. We went to... Holding our Arboretum yesterday with our son and daughter, our son Kendrick and daughter-in-law Kristen, and it was amazing. Hadn't been there in years. If if you haven't been, you know they have 3,600 acres that you can just go hanging out uh, in of, of beautiful forests and gorgeous gardens and amazing trails. And they have this canopy walk where you're you're kind of way up in, in high in the trees over this this gorge. And then they've got this tower that you hike up, and it actually you're, you're over the canopy, and you can see all the way to Lake Erie, and it's just stunningly beautiful if you like the outdoors. So I highly, highly recommend it, um, for sure. And always good to hang out with our son and daughter-in-law. We're lucky to have their Kendrick's the only son that lives here in town, so it's it's great to spend time with them and not have to jump in a car or jump on a plane, right? So. Our Kenyans are in Milwaukee, Connor's in Austin, and Cameron, his wife, Tay, and their daughter, um, Roe, are up in Boston. So, Good for 5K races, too. I did not know that, Teresa. I did not know that. Very cool to know. All right. Well, why don't, uh, why don't we jump in, And because I'm just kind of teeing up for a second anyway, and... Um, I want to talk a little bit first about men's group because we're wrapping up tonight. Um, we're wrapping up a book of Mark's study with the cookouts, burgers, like I said, and uh, having some, some manly music from some of the fellowship band. So good morning, Derek. Good morning, Jennifer. But uh, if you were in men's um, group this, this past winter or into this Mark study, join us. If you weren't, join us anyway. It's just, it's just a night for guys, manly music burgers. It's going to be a good night. So men's group, um, COVID was hitting as we were ending up the first Peter study. And, and really as guys, we all just kind of looked around at each other. And, and that's when the insanity was really happening. And the men felt like, you know, we just, we need some Jesus. So rather than just end like we normally would have, we just, you know, we prayerfully bounced into a new study and it ended up being um, the Gospel of Mark with Francis Chan on Right Now Media. So I don't know how many of you have have gone on and set up an account at rightnowmedia.org, but they've got this huge collection of, of Bible studies, of topical studies, you know, with some of the best-known pastors in, in, in just leaders, men and women in the country. So it's a phenomenal resource. And so during COVID, they're making their content, which is normally, you know, expensive as a church, you have to pay a monthly fee to have access to it. It's open to anybody. So I would say go set up an account with rightnowmedia.org and it, it'll be a great resource for you. So anyway, 35 to 40 guys have been meeting faithfully on Monday nights right into this beautiful weather. So I'm, I'm really, really, really proud of the guys. So Mark's been really impactful. And, um, and so today I want to talk about why you should go read or reread the book of Mark. Uh, and first I'll give you a little scholarly background on, on Mark, um, on the book, because I think it's always good to understand when you go into reading a book, the background, and, uh, and also when you, you know, have the opportunity to talk to other people about something you're reading in the Bible, to, to have that understanding that you can share with them would be great. So Mark was written by John Mark. He wasn't an apostle or a disciple. It's just a young man whose mom hosted a, a home church. We knew that, we know that Peter hung out there. Um, John Mark did missionary travels with Paul and Barnabas, 
although he really hacked off Paul when he quit one of the missionary journeys, he, he's later spoken of fondly by Paul for his work on behalf of the gospel. So it's really a great comeback story, and I, I would encourage you to learn a little bit more about John Mark. But Mark's important because it's almost certainly the first gospel written. It's the foundation book for the synoptic gospels that all of the other gospels, well, not the others, but Matthew and, Mark and Luke, the other synoptic gospels, um, most of their material comes from Mark. It's considered to be Jesus' story as told by Peter to Mark, and that's a devotional right there, right? Because Peter was such an interesting person, and a key theme is that Jesus is a suffering servant as predicted and prophesied by Isaiah 700 years earlier. And, and here's what I would say as well. Mark is a really accessible book, and it's an easy-to-read book for a couple reasons. One, it's the shortest of the Gospels. So it's kind of like a Cliff Notes um, when it comes to the Gospels. It rockets through Jesus' ministry in Galilee and then to his last week in Jerusalem in only 15 chapters. 47 times Mark uses some version of the word immediately or just then to keep the, to keep the narrative you know, just flowing along. So it really propels you from episode to episode. It's never boring. And it's kind of an action novel. It's less of what Jesus said and a lot more of his actions and humanity. It's what he did. And it just shows Jesus constantly on the move. So check it out. It's, it's exciting. It's a quick read. And especially if you read, you know, maybe the NLT, the New Living Translation, you can fly through it really, really quickly. But I think most importantly, because we see this emphasis on Jesus' actions, there's, there's three takeaways that can impact our lives. I mean, there's a hundred, but there's three that really jumped out to me as I started to think about, you know, the Gospel of Mark. So the first thing is, as Christians, we need to have a sense of urgency. Jesus, again, he's portrayed as this man constantly and tirelessly on the move with his ministry. He's a savior who has only three years to set the foundation for his kingdom, and he's just relentlessly going along his business and, and taking the disciples along for a ride, right? So just by the end of the first chapter, Jesus has been baptized. He's preached in Galilee. He's here, healed Peter's mother-in-law. He opens Peter's mother-in-law's door to see the whole city of Capernaum there. So he heals a bunch who are sick and casts out demons. He went to all the synagogues in Galilee. And I'm sorry, well, actually it should be phrased. He went to synagogues in all of Galilee, not sure he went to all of them, but that's a huge area, preaching and casting out demons, and why not? He closes out the chapter by healing a leper. So compare that to Matthew's gospel, where Jesus had just barely been born by the end of chapter 1. Uh, after that, Jesus gets Peter, James, John, and, and Matthew to drop their livelihoods and instantly follow him. He preaches parables, he feeds 5,000, he walks on water, he heals the demoniac, does more healing, feeds another 4,000, um, he gets transfigured. And so I'm thinking, with all this going on, what could I accomplish if I had the sense of urgency that Jesus and his disciples did when it comes to the kingdom? I mean, like Jesus, our time here is really short, and we're those few workers in the vineyard that the Bible references, right? So a sense of urgency means that we just need to start understanding and acting like every relationship we have, every person we meet, every chance we have to nurture spiritually children or our own children or grandchildren. Those are all opportunities to, to serve and to share the good news. And I, I think sometimes, like the disciples, we just need to drop things in our life, not our livelihoods, but some activities are maybe a waste of time or selfish behaviors that we can redirect to the kingdom. Second takeaway is just developing a servant mindset. See, Mark is just intent on showing that Jesus' actions are as a servant and a servant leader. I think it's about 13 times that someone asked Jesus to, to heal them, and Mark, he, he doesn't ever say no. He's feeding, he's encouraging, he's healing, he's freeing from bondage those who are in demonic possession, he's forgiving sins, he's teaching. And so we're, we're shown Jesus' serving actions. But I think what Mark really makes clear is that servanthood goes much deeper than just doing nice things. So in chapter 10, Jesus defines who he is 
and what he calls his disciples to be, and, and really what he calls us to be as well. So first, Jesus tells the twelve in Mark 10, verses 33 to 34, says, hey, we're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man, that's me. I'm going to be delivered up to the chief priests. I'm going to be condemned to death. I'm going to be handed over to the Romans. They're going to mock me. They're going to spit on me. They're going to flog me. And they're going to kill me. And then in one of the most dazzling displays of tone deafness and selfishness that we maybe see in the entire Bible, James and John, the bros of thunder, and I, I cut them some slack. They're, what, 16, 17 years old? Show me a 16 or 17-year-old boy that makes rational good decisions. But they come to him and say, oh, you know, okay, interesting teacher. But hey, can one of us sit on the right and the other on the left of you up in heaven? And, and then that starts an argument where, you know, the disciples are arguing amongst each other and probably over, hey, you think you're the greatest? I'm the greatest disciple. So in Mark 10, verses 42 to 45, Jesus calls them back together and says, All right, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, the Son of God daily emptied and exhausted himself in his human incarnation, right? To serve those around him. So we are to be slaves to others. Whether they're rich or poor, black, white, women, men, it doesn't matter. Now this is an upside down model, right? That flies completely in the face of everything our culture and our TV shows and our commercials tell us. The world of the world's model is power and authority and lording over others and having other people seek to serve us, right? So this isn't just about serving, according to Jesus, or volunteering. This is a, a mindset, a servant mindset. You have to start thinking like a servant. So that's literally a life-changing head change because that impacts the way we genuinely treat people. So I think we each need to start asking ourselves as we interact with other people at work, at church, in our family, in the community, am I lording or am I serving? And if the answer isn't serving, then we need to change our hearts and minds and actions and prayers in a way that we get that answer right. So it makes sense. Serving isn't just going and doing something. It is, it is the whole way we think about who we are in relation to others which then impacts the way we interact with them, really from a place of humility. Third takeaway is just understanding the immensity of the greatest act of love in human history. So at, at two-thirds of the way through the book of Mark, at the beginning of chapter 11, Jesus makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Crowd's going crazy, Hosanna, Hosanna. We know that less than a week later, that same crowd is going to be screaming, crucify him, right? So Jesus knew what was coming, and he told his disciples in, in Mark 9 and 10 that, you know, he was, he was going to have to die a heinous death. But what really hits you in the gut is you read um, these latter chapters in Mark is the night that Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he becomes to be distressed and, and troubled. And he said to Peter, James, and John, you know, set watch, he said, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Just remain here for me, please. So Jesus could go deeper into the garden and pray. And that's what he did. And he fell to the ground and he prayed that if possible, that this hour might pass. So now we're in um, Mark 14, verses 35 and 36. He prayed that this hour would pass. Wouldn't we all? So Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. And we so, you know, we're seeing this fully human side of Jesus, right? As he pleads with his daddy. That's what Abba means. Daddy, daddy, please save me from this awful destiny. But Jesus knows that he can't escape because it's been set down since eternity. And I think we need to understand it's not just the awfulness of being treated like dirt 
and beaten and whipped and hung on a cross to die a horrific death. But that Jesus, he had to metaphysically take on all the sins of mankind. Every, every sin that had gone before him, the people living then, people living now, all the sins of people yet to come that God calls to him. And then he had to be separated for the first time in eternity from his father. That, that ultimately was what he was completely broken about. So we ask that prayer, Lord, take this cup from me. Father, Daddy. But then what, what does Jesus say? He says, All right, yet not what I will, but what you will, Father. That's love. That's love for the Father. That's this incredible love for us. And at this point in, in Francis Chan's video, he is literally screaming at the camera. Do you understand what this means? The gospel method, message of Jesus' act of self-sacrifice and, and God sacrificing his only son. Chan calls across the greatest act of love in human history. And if we, don't, if we don't understand that it makes everything else in our life look foolish and worthless, like nothing compared to the cross, we don't get it. And Francis said this kind of, this understanding that, that the cross is so much bigger than everything else in our life. And it makes everything else in our life look menial and like nothing, like trash, he says, then we need to understand it. And I'm just saying, guys, sorry, this is a, this is a Monday. And this is, you know, usually Matt Clark's on and he's making us all happy. But that, this is what the Lord laid on me. So that kind of understanding deep into our souls uh, and a heart change of really understanding what, what that cross meant you know, that should drive a radical change in us and a humility that helps us want to develop a servant's mindset. And that mindset should drive us to a sense of urgency to look at the short time we have on earth and, and just maximize the interactions we have with others to love and to serve and to witness because we don't know when that one minute we have someone might be the one minute that they have that God's going to use to change their lives. So I had a little different wrap up here, but last night uh, my pal Keith Malugin came to mind. And, and you've, you've heard Keith on here before, and he's one of the missionaries we support in the, in the DR. You may know his story. Uh, he had this challenge in life, and he had to, to leave youth ministry. And yet he felt called with his wife Amy <clears throat> to minister to women in the sex trade in the Dominican Republic. And with his usual sense of urgency... Keith and Amy went out and spent a year, and, and they raised support, and they moved to the DR, where essentially they gave up what could have been a great lifestyle um, to serve and, and make a huge impact in a really tough community and a ton of women's lives. And I know that Keith appreciates the cross as a defining moment in history because he tracked my son Cameron down, often driving to his school to share the life-changing word of the gospel. And my son Cameron has a rock-solid faith. And I thank Cam, I'm sorry, I thank Keith for his part in Cam's journey. So Keith's not Jesus, neither are we, but like Keith, like the disciples, I think we can get urgent. We can think like a servant. We can share that greatest act of love in human history. And, and those actions will, will change the lives of others. And, and maybe it just starts with reading the book of Mark, right? Great book, short. Francis Chan said, read it, reread it, reread it until its full impact really sinks in. All right. I have not been keeping track of comments. Um, so <laughs> because my head's been focused on this, but let's, let's pray and we'll do a little housekeeping and then we'll head, head you all out on your Mondays. Father God, we give thanks for you. We give thanks for the book of Mark and the other Gospels. They are life-changing, Lord. And I pray that as we read them, that, um, that they would change us. I give thanks for people that are ready to dig into your word on a Monday morning. I love it. And I pray that, um, that we'll all go have a week and, and have a sense of urgency and want to go serve. And we love your son Jesus more. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. So just a quick reminder that we're going to survey the connected group sometime in the next day or two, so keep an eye on that. We really want your input. There's 500 and some people that, um, that 
jump on this channel. We get a couple hundred people typically looking at the devo devotional, so we really, really want your um, your input. And um, I think that's about it. We'll be back at church this Sunday. Look forward to seeing everybody. God bless. Have a great week. Take care.